Ladies and gentlemen, the first uh, line-in talk after the lunch break is uh, presented by Shane McIntosh, and he will talk about uh, identifying hotspots in software. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, like you said, my name's Shane. I'm a PhD student from Queen's University in Canada, and I study software build systems. And before I start my talk, I just want to mention that uh, we have a survey. We're asking developers how hotspots or how build performance is impacting your work on a daily basis. So if you check my Twitter handle, um, we just tweeted out a link to the survey. It would be awesome if you filled it out. So yeah, but on to the task at hand. Today's topic, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about an approach we designed to find hotspots in software projects. But I always find it helpful to first describe what I mean by a build system. So if we imagine that this pile of blocks is the source code of your software system, and we imagine that this spaceship is what we want to deliver to our customers, well, the build system is the set of order-dependent instructions that have to be executed in order to get from the blocks to the spaceship. Or in software terms, it's like your make files, your configuration scripts, these sort of things that describe how source code and documentation are translated into deliverables and documentation for the end customer, and eventually packaged. And since the 1970s, we've decided that this is the, the working model that developers follow. So we first start out looking at the source code and thinking about how we want to edit the code, how we want to implement something. Then we added the code to actually put that into a realization. Then we add, uh, we execute the build system. So we take the stuff that we changed, integrate it into deliverables so that we can test our change and see how that works. But under this model, all builds are equal. So it just looks like it's the third step in a four-step process. But in reality, some builds are more equal than others, or some builds cost more, take longer than other ones. And a recent XKCD comic kind of highlights that, saying that slow builds are, or compilations are uh, the number one reason for developers kind of slacking off. And some recent discussions on the GTK mailing list suggest that their build is so slow that it's actually impacting the way that they get their work done. So now that we know that build performance can actually impact developers, what can we do about it? Well, one of the examples of improving your software projects is to use refactorings. So if we imagine that there's this very simple project made up of four C files at the bottom here, and they're compiled into objects and libraries and two deliverables, um, we'll notice that there are some builds that would be slower than others. So for example, if we change this utility file at the bottom, it would trigger a recompilation, a re-archive, and then two relinks, which is uh, before refactoring, that's triggering four commands. Now, now if we look at this graph and we see that actually deliverable one is, only, is the only one using util1.c, and deliverable two just ends up discarding it at length time, well, we can refactor the code to look something like this, where now a change to util1.c would only trigger two commands. So now we've saved two commands, which will save time in the long run. But the question is, OK, refactoring can help. But in a real system made up of thousands of files, or tens of thousands of files in some cases, which files should we focus on to get the most benefit? Where should we focus our refactoring effort? And the first thing that comes to mind is, well, look at the slowest files to rebuild. But it may be that those files rarely change. So if you, if you focus on one header file, for example, and it only rarely changes, you're not really saving much time for the project in the long run. So maybe we should look at the files that change the most often, since those are the ones that are going to have to be rebuilt the most. But it may be that those files are already optimal. So even if you did look at those, you couldn't really do much to refactor them anyways. So in this work, we, say, we argue that you should really focus on what we call build hotspots. So the files that not only rebuild slowly, but also change often. 
So we designed this three-step approach to find these files, these hotspot files. We begin first by extracting a dependency graph from your software system. So this would be like the example of, that I was showing for refactoring. <coughs> Next, we take that dependency graph and we analyze it to try and find the slowly rebuilding files. We end up with a database of results. Then we visit your version uh, control system, so your Git repository or these sorts of things, and we try and find the files that changed the most frequently in the past, and we presume that they'll continue to change the most frequently in the future, and combine that information into a visualization, a quadrant plot. So I'll describe each one of these steps a little bit more in detail now. So first, we're going to extract the dependency graph from your software system. And for this, we use a tool called Macal, which will look at uh, the debug output of the make, uh, uh, a make instantiation, and it'll produce this sort of graph that looks like this. So we have on the outside the, the source code files, so no edges are going into them, so they aren't generated by anything that make does. And as you move more further into the middle of the, uh, the graph, that's where everything's coming together and getting linked. Next, so we have this big graph now. We can see which files trigger the most commands, but it may be that some commands take longer than others. So we really wanted a cost measure for each edge in the graph that really represented something concrete. So what we did is we, we executed a full clean build and timed each command. And we did this 10 times. And we take the median of that since uh, loads on your system can vary. So now we know how much it costs to uh, traverse each edge in the graph. We can now trace our way through the graph and find out how long each build would take. Then we wanted to know how frequently these files would change. So we did something very simple. We just look at uh, the Git repository, and for each line uh, in the log history, we count that as one change. And then, so finally, we want to bring these two pieces of information together. We, we put them together on a graph that looks like this. So on the x-axis, we show the rebuild cost. On the y-axis, we show the number of changes. And then we plot for each file, it's a position on this XY grid. And now, using thresholds, we can decide which are the files that we want to focus on. So depending on how patient you are or how frequently things are changing in your system, you can configure these thresholds. And then we argue that those are the files up in the top right corner that you want to try to refactor first. So the files that are slowly rebuilding and, and uh, change frequently. So now that we have a metal detector, we have our approach, we, we said let's try it out on a few open source systems. And for that we had to pick some thresholds. So based on some literature on continuous delivery, we selected a threshold for rebuild cost of 90 seconds. So anything that builds slower than 90 seconds, we assumed that was too slow for people. Then we, we picked the median uh, number of changes for how frequently stuff was changing. So if, it, if you're changing more than half, more than fast as half of the, the files in your system, then those files are changing frequently. And we picked three systems of different sizes. One really big one, the Qt framework, uh, GTK, and the Postgres uh, relational database. And these are just some properties of their, their build graphs. So for example, uh, Qt actually has 2.7 million edges in its graph. Uh, GTK has about 100,000, 100, and then at another order of magnitude smaller is the Postgres build system. And then we wanted to produce our quadrant plots, so here are some examples from uh, GTK first. And what we found is about 65 files in their system we identify as hotspots with those two thresholds I, I mentioned earlier. About 7% of all the, the source files. But beyond that, we found that you wouldn't actually have to fix all 65 of these files. We found that there were main culprits that actually dragged other files in. So I point out a couple of them here. So there's the, the main glib header file and glib object file. Uh, but the max build time here was 148 seconds, so just a little over two minutes. 
Next, we look at the Postgres system. It looks a little different. In fact, only 2% of their, their files were identified as hotspots. And there were about five main culprits. But the worst case grew a little bit. We're a little over three minutes now. And if we turn to uh, the, the QT system, which was the biggest one that we looked at, we said, oh boy, they're in some pretty serious trouble here. There are some files, actually, that take more than two hours to rebuild. So if you're unlucky enough to have touched one of those files, yeah, you'd uh, better go for some lunch or something before you can keep working. So rather than identifying some, some of the main culprits like we did with the other systems, 732 files of a system that we weren't really familiar with was a little too much for us. But we did uh, look at hotspot concentration in uh, directories. So we identified some directories that had abnormally high uh, hotspot concentration. So of all the files in that directory, many of them were hotspots. And uh, the core library shows up, as well as this XML patterns one, which is used to parse XML. So we did these three studies. and. Uh, we saw that there were some general trends. And what really percolated out was this transitive property of build hotspots. So if we imagine that we have a, a file called hot.c, and it gets linked into several ex executables. So let's just say it goes up to n. So it's changed, uh, it costs a lot to rebuild this file. Now, if this file also changes frequently, we would say, yes, that file is a hotspot. But not only that, if that file includes a header file, and this header file is unlucky enough to change frequently as well, well, there's another hotspot. But it gets worse than that. If this file is also included in another header file, which then also includes a bunch of other header files, and a few of those are unlucky enough to be hotspots, well, this hub now becomes like a super hotspot. This thing takes forever to rebuild. So really what, we're, what we've found is that you want to limit the use of what we call header file hubs as much as possible. So these are header files that just serve to collect other header files. Um, like making those available for external use is great, but internally if you use them, you end up uh, uh, accumulating build time, these sorts of things. So just to briefly sum up what I've been talking about, first we said that not all builds are equal. Some, some files take much longer than other ones to rebuild. And we can fix those sorts of problems by refactoring. But the problem that we still have is in a large system, which files should we focus on refactoring to get the most benefit? And we argue that you should focus on these hotspot files, which are the ones that rebuild slowly and also change often. And we came up with this three-step approach and a pretty simple visualization to uh, show you which files you need to refactor first. And then we did an open source case study and found some interesting things, some slowly rebuilding files, and highlighted this transitive property of build hotspots. So I have a couple more minutes left. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. And thanks for your attention. Um, one more thing. I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, on my Twitter page, I, I tweeted out a link for a survey, a developer survey. We really want to know how build performance is impacting you on a daily basis. If you could take five minutes and fill it out, it would be really helpful. Thanks. Yeah, please. Uh, just a moment, sir. Thanks. Uh, are there any tools available to do this on our own <laughs> source code? Um, not quite yet. We just started doing these sort of analyses, but we're working towards automating it and making it available. I think there's a, a question over here. Sorry. 
Hi, great talk so far. Did, did you find any correlation between programming languages and particularly bad projects? Programming languages. Um, so we've only looked at three so far, and um, I guess Qt was a C++ one, and the other two were C, but it's a little hard to draw causality from such a small set of data. Okay, thank you very much.